Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to the Risen Nation Church podcast. I pray that this message today impact your life and above all, draw you into a deeper encounter with Jesus. All right, let's get intense. May 27th, the Lord said something to me and this isn't, this isn't what um, he said last Sunday, but it'll lead into it. I was praying and I heard this. I was actually praying and reading John chapter three, uh, where I've been for a while. It's, it's being born of God and we've been ministering on this. Um, but I was reading it and this word came to me. I heard the Lord say, if you aren't paying attention, you'll miss it. If you simply move along according to old patterns, old standards and old thinking, you'll miss it. If you aren't looking, how can you see? If you are hiding in your shelter called religion, you won't catch the wind. I don't want to pass. I don't want the wind to pass over me. I want the wind to go through me. And I hear the sound of it, but I can't see it yet. I see the effects of it like birds who seek shelter before the storm. Many will run to hide from the rain, but for those who are asking for it, righteousness is about to hit the earth like rain. Wickedness will be eradicated and the just will receive the reward. And I sense this from the Lord. It's urgent. It's now. The wind is picking up and God is saying, it's time to come out of hiding because rain is imminent. And, and, I, and I feel this urgency oh, from the Lord that is like, if I love you, I'll tell you the truth. This urgency from the Lord that is like, playtime, complacency, all these things are coming to an end. And we sing the songs, come Lord Jesus, come. But I don't know if we actually weigh that statement properly. Because when we weigh that statement properly, what we're saying is, is Lord come. And in a moment, whatever future I thought I had, whatever I envision for my kids when they grow up, it's over in that moment. And we all will become one in the Lord as heaven and earth come together, right? It, it, and for that day, and, you're, and we're gonna see it in a minute, it says, great is the day of the Lord. And well, how does it finish? And who can endure it? Wow. So when I see all the pride month nonsense and I see what's happening in the news, there's this urgency that of course the world is gonna get darker. It's what Isaiah 60 says. But if the glory of the Lord, as the world gets darker, if the glory of the Lord is not seen upon you, God forbid we just mimic the world yet singing, come Lord Jesus, come, having no idea that that statement, the indication is, is that he will eradicate wickedness from the earth right? Like when we're talking about money, people think we just want offerings so we can pay bills. You don't understand. I've watched this as a pastor for years now. Follow what's happening in the economy and you'll see what's happening in giving. People give when people's giving goes down when inflation goes up and they say, well, I need eggs. Well, of course you need eggs, right? Or, or the or the wrong president is in and you don't, and you, you don't give or whatever. Like we, it's like we turn the church into a market right? And the, and the proclamation, when we give based on what's happening in the economy and on the flip side of that hoard, when we, when we see what's happening in the economy, what the proclamation that you're giving is, is money, you are my refuge. I don't see, I know that this is going to offend a lot of people and I'm fine. Even, listen, I'm fine if you've got like a freezer with a bunch of meat in it and cans and a bomb shelter. That's fine. Like if that's what some of you Texans are like, I got a safe with 53 guns and I'm gonna start passing them out when Armageddon happens. I'm like, honestly, there's a, there's a weird side because I watch too many movies. I'm just like, yeah, let's do it. I'm down, right? Just start handing guns to the kids. Okay, so if you do that, that's fine. I, you know, my dad is so funny. He, he's like preaches against fear and stuff and like tornadoes are warnings. He's calling all of us. He's like, get in the shelter now. I'm like, it's, it's on the other state. It's in Oklahoma. So I'm fine if that's who you are, what you do. I just, in the New Testament, I don't see them building bomb shelters. <laughs> I don't see the disciples having emergency kits. Like we live in America, guys. Like I know Joe Biden's the president and the whole world's going to hell. But the reality is, is we live in America and it, it ain't that bad. Like 
Like the disciples are in Rome, people are getting crucified, people are dying, and they're going to the temple every day and still praying and singing out loud. Like they weren't hiding in their corners and, and hoarding money. No, 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 they were, they were selling land bringing all the proceeds to the apostles' feet. And when they lied, they died. That's in the New Testament. So don't say, come, Lord Jesus, come, without carrying the weight in your life of what that actually means. So if you're gonna say, come, Lord Jesus, come, make sure your money is also saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. Make sure your kids are also saying, come Lord Jesus, come. Make sure you walk in a way that says, come Lord Jesus, come. We are a bride that is ready. This is the job of the Holy Spirit to prepare you. He is your bomb shelter. He is your emergency kit. And there's nothing money, the world or the government can provide for you. The dollar gets weaker and weaker and the word gets stronger and stronger. And we are still concerned about the darkness. No, the darkest hour in the world will be the greatest hour in the church. Okay, so there's this urgency I've, I've had in my spirit from the Lord. And I find it very fascinating that he has had me and us as a community in this revelation of his love that everything God is gonna do is driven by his passionate love and grace. And I think what he's been doing here is he's been working on our lens because what he's saying, if you have the wrong lens, when you hear me today, if you have the wrong lens, you'll receive it as condemnation. But if you have the right lens, you'll receive it as a father who's interested in reproving you because he loves you. If you have the right lens, you'll realize he pays close attention to his children. And what encourages me is that he cares enough to say something. Okay, so let's pray. Cause I think we're gonna need it. Just lift your hands like this, Lord. And I'll try to be funny throughout to help, but I just can't promise anything. Cause I'm feeling kind of crazy. Lord, give me a tender heart today. Lord, as we hear your words, may our hearts be soft. May our lens be correct. Like a father, a mother speaking to their children passionately in love. Lord, may no offense enter into this room in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So like I said, I was, I was wrestling and I've thought about, you know, things that Pastor Kossi and I have talked about. You know, our goal here is not to build big numbers and big numbers of members in churches. Our goal is to build a certain quality of people. The Lord doesn't need 5,000 to accomplish what he wants. The Lord found 12. And those 12 ended up leaving him on a cross and he had to ascend to get them back. He, he doesn't, I mean, Paul, he found 12 men in Asia Minor, all of Asia Minor, hear the gospel in two years. The Lord doesn't need uh, five, he doesn't need, okay, help me, Jesus. He doesn't need stadium Christianity. I'm down for stadium Christianity. That would be amazing if we like packed the Dallas Cowboys arena for the Lord. But you know, like the problem I have is, is that you go home after the service and I'd like to sit there as they walk out and take inventory of whose life was actually changed. And not that saying that not lives don't get changed. Lives do get changed. But I think the Lord can use, I'm gonna get in trouble, but whatever. I think that the Lord could come into a living room and find 10 people of one spirit, of one mind, that aren't needy, that know who they are in Christ, and he can empower them with the qualities of the spirit together. And they will become more effective, just 10 in a city than 50,000 who are just doing religious ceremony. Okay. So I think the Lord is about to show up in small groups again. I think he's about to show up in little prayer rooms again, where there's 15 people or living rooms with your kids. And, and what God breathes on is brethren in unity. And I've learned over the years that when you have a thousand people, when you have 900 people, you got a lot of issues on your hands. Now I want it. I want, that's fine if that's what God does, but that is not our goal. That is not our mission. 
I actually, you know, when we started Risen Nation Church in 2019, I remember making this statement. It's like, I, in a way, God's hold, held us to it. I remember saying, and I, you know, it's funny. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I remember saying, what would it be like if when we hit 500, we expanded so that communities actually continue to feel like family? We hit 500 and God expanded us. And I'm like, oh my Lord. And, and you don't realize like, there is this concept I feel like we're missing in the church called family. You know, you know two people, you talk to the same people and a lot of people go to the, the places where they just get in and out. That is not what we are trying to build. 10 years from now, if we have a mega building in DFW and there's 5,000 people there, we will not say on that day that we hit our five-year goal. I actually think the separation of the wheats and the tares will get more intense then. I think the intensity will increase more then. But God is looking for a quality of people. He, he's, Bill Johnson, Danny Silk one time was sitting with us and he, he said, or no, um, I actually heard Chris Fallotton say this, but Danny said the same thing. Chris Fallotton said one time they were sitting in a meeting and Bill, Bill Johnson's sitting there and he doesn't talk much, but when he does, the room changes and everyone kind of shuts up. And so, Chris said, I was giving all these ideas of the five-year plan and how we're, gonna, how we're gonna scale the church and how we're gonna grow the church. And everyone's like, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. And Chris said, he was like the leader in like saying how they're gonna grow and scale. And Bill just quietly speaks up after just sitting there for the whole meeting and says, I'm not interested in building a big church. I wanna build big people. And everybody got quiet. And Chris said, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> that's, that, that's ex you just said it, per that's exactly what I was saying as well. But you watch a man like that who had that heart and look at the results of what God's done is God finds communities that aren't interested in filling stadiums. They're interested in being exactly what God has called them to be and just being faithful with what God has said. And as they're faithful, if God wants to fill the stadium, let God fill the stadium. But may our hearts never leave the one desire in which we started this church for, which was God comes here and he goes, I can rest. Okay, so... I think that my brother, uh, Pastor Kossi, doesn't know in full understanding, you know, he's been on this offense thing, the purification of fire. And I don't think he even realizes like how much the Lord has been preparing us, talking to us about his love and his mercy, changing, his, changing the lens in which we see the father through. He comes in, talks about offense. And now I'm realizing why based on what the Lord is speaking to me. And I want to remind you, like he's been saying, Psalms 119.65 says, great peace. We talk about the peace of God. Great joining with God. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, have they which love your law and nothing shall offend them. That word law is amazing to me. It means instruction, direction, and reign. Great and peace to those who like when you rain righteousness down. Nothing will offend those who are out of the hiding and saying, downpour on me. So may we all have this heart today. Can you guys open your Bibles to Exodus 28? Exodus 28. And I wanna describe as we begin the duty of a priest. Now I'm coming at it. How many of you know there's an order in God? Say amen if you believe that. Okay. Everything God does, he does in order. He, he doesn't, it says he is not the author of confusion, right? So he's not involved in, if you go into an environment and you're confused of, uh, and you leave feeling not edified because maybe everyone, Paul, Paul actually speaks against this in 1 Corinthians 14. You walk into an environment and everyone just is screaming in tongues the whole service. He says, I'd rather say a few words in understanding than, than just rambling on with that which edifies me before God. And he's dealing with how they gather that there's an order to how you gather. There's an order to how you lead. So we believe that we are all kings and priests, right? Like hopefully we, you know that, right? That, that we, know don't, we don't need Moses and Aaron anymore leading up, up mountains. God in his word tells us that we are all, everyone say all kings and priests unto God. You know, it, it even says in, um, 
in the book of Numbers, I believe in chapter uh, 10 or 11, it, it talks about Joshua is upset because people are beginning to prophesy and he says, tell them to stop. He says that to Moses, tell them to stop. Moses' response is beautiful. He says, are you jealous? It's always those closest to you. As you start empowering people, they say, tell them to stop. And we call it authority. But Moses responds to Joshua. He says, are you jealous for my sake? And he says, how I wish all my prophesy. So the heart of the Lord is, is that we all step into priesthood, but even in us all stepping into priesthood, David had to learn the hard lesson that there's a way in which God comes, even though we're all a priesthood, not every part of the body is the same. And I think everyone wants to be a head that's seen and has Instagram followers. People aren't interested in being ligaments, but, but you can't walk in the body without the ligament, lig ligaments, ligaments. And he says, the weaker parts of the body are actually worthy of more honor. But because we, again, go by the patterns of the world, we think people with influence are the only ones actually accomplishing anything for the Lord. And we've heard it said, he didn't say at the end of the age, well done, my good and influential servant, but he says, my good and faithful servant. God is looking for people that'll be faithful because I'm sorry to tell you 99% of this community will not have a ministry with a 501c3. I mean, you study numbers. There's not many people. Everyone wants to build something for God, but God is like, no, can you be like me at your job and be the part of the body I've called you to be? And if you try to be anything else, you're going to be depressed. I just want to just let you know, when you try to do anything outside of what God has called you to do, it will not work because he's God and he's in charge. So, so we got to learn how to fit the body together. My right hand can't tell my left hand, I have no need of you. If I lost my thumb, God forbid, life would be horrific. How do you do that? Sorry, if you don't have a thumb, we could pray, grow that thing out, okay? But you imagine like if you lost your thumbs, it would be horrible. And so this little short stubby finger, it's more shorter and stubby than the rest. Maybe my pinky, there's a, I got a weird bump on my pinky. But the reality is, is that the things that I take, and this is what we do in the body, the things that I take for granted, like picking up something without the smallest part of my body functioning, I can't pick it up. And this is the state of the church in the West because we all want the same position, influence. We all wanna be the mouth, but if there's no hands, we will not accomplish anything. So we gotta learn that God has a way in which he does things, he has an order. So again, as you hear me today, I want to make sure that you understand, don't, don't try to put words in my mouth that I'm not saying. Can you make me that deal today? Don't, so I'm gonna tell you in the beginning, you are all kings and priests unto the Lord. Now, when it comes to risen nation, not everyone's a pastor. Not everybody is in a position of leadership. Not everybody is in a role that I'm going to read about, okay? Same body, different functions. All priests unto God, but some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some pastors. Some bit. And, and if you're not part of the some, don't be condemned. Be faithful with what you are. Just be faithful. God is looking for faithfulness and you'll be more effective being faithful than trying your whole life to be a part of some. Let me tell you, the sum is hard. We all get to be priests unto God, but, but being a priest and leading people isn't for everyone. Okay, so anyway, Exodus 28. Then, are you guys there? Verse one, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother. I was, I was reading this and I thought about when Corey came and he prophesied over Costi that he's Aaron. So I, I'm literally reading this and I, the Lord is speaking to me, Aaron, your brother. And I'm, okay, I get what you're talking about here, Lord. And his sons, and I, and, and I want you to hear, this is important for Dallas, okay? Bring Aaron, your brother and his sons with them from among the people of Israel to serve me. That word serve is to minister to me as priests. Aaron and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Let's see if that one is correct. Verse two, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. I'm gonna make Costi a, a garment that's beautiful and he has to wear it. 
I'm going to, uh, yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you what Pastor Tanner just said. So glorious and beautiful, okay? And you shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill that they make that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So again, I want you to see, you, you're talking about two different groups here. You're talking about someone who wears the garment, but they can't wear it unless it's made by someone who has the spirit of wisdom and skill upon them to put that garment on the person. So as we make this transition, it's not just Pastor Costi taking a role, it's everyone has to take their role. Everyone has to take their place that we might put the garment that God is requiring on correctly as a family. And he goes on and he says, these are the garments that you shall make. And this is important. I want you to underline this. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, and a coat, or um, one translation says a linen tunic of checker work a turban and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me or minister to me as priests. And I just want to give a shout out to Pastor Kaylee because she ministered about this, some of this with our students, our SOH students. And uh, when I was really struggling with what to preach today, I came across her message at SOH and I said, that's it. Like, this is what God is saying. So I'm going to even repeat some of what she said. It was really powerful. But I want you to write this down, the linen tunic, which again in the ESV is just called the coat. That, that word linen tunic, it, it's, it's a cover. It symbolizes grace. I want you to make notes today. It symbolizes grace or cover. This would be what is closest to the priest's body is grace, the cover. The robe... So again, as you, I want you to picture this. You've got a priest. He's wearing the closest thing to his body is a linen tunic. On top of that is a robe. Then on top of the robe is an ephod. These guys were probably very sweaty. And I never understood how the Lord's like, but no sweat in the most holy place. I'm like, how is that even possible? But anyway, Lord's like one bead, death. So anyway, still learning God. Um, but he makes him dress in four layers. So Linen ephod, robe, or I'm sorry, linen, tunic, robe, ephod. You got three layers on. So the closest layer, it represents grace. The second layer, which is the robe, write this down. It means mantle or mandate. The third layer, which is the ephod, it's the most beautiful. Ephod means image. So I want you to see what this is speaking of. The duty of a priest is by his grace, which is the closest thing. It's that which covers your nakedness, okay? By his grace, we are given the mandate. You see this literally in the clothing of the priests. By his grace, we are given the mandate to bear his image. By God's grace, we are given the mandate to bear his image. Now, on top of the ephod, and I wish we had, one day we'll have a screen in here. Uh, when we have the money to have one that drops down. But I'm looking at a picture that you're not looking at. But the only way I can describe it is there is a, on top of the ephod, there's a breastplate and the breastplate has 12 precious stones in it. Different colors, beautiful. So the breastplate is here, 12 stones in it. And then where the breastplate connects on the shoulders, there's two onyx stones and the names of the sons of Israel are on the onyx stones, okay? But the 12 stones on the breastplate also have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. This, it, what it's symbolizing is, is that the priest is bearing, bearing on his heart the names of the sons, okay? And, and again, it's resting upon grace. But I want you to, to see as we keep reading, Verse nine, it says, and you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in order of their birth. Then jump to verse 12. And you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. Listen to this. And Aaron shall bear their names before God on his two shoulders. I want you to see there's something about leadership in this, that the duty of your leader is to bear your, his, 
to bear your names before God on his shoulder. And, and again, people, I immediately heard it is like, this is kind of Old Testament. No, you're gonna see it's everywhere in scripture that God sets men and women in your life to oversee your soul, Hebrews tells us. So, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. And then verse 15, and you shall make a breastplate of judgment. I want you to underline that, a breastplate of judgment. This is where we start losing people because nobody likes to be corrected. But his requirement was you're gonna bear the names on your chest and the, the breastplate is for judgment. He says, in the style of the ephod, you shall make of it gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, you shall make it. And then go to verse 29. So between verses 16 to 28, he begins to describe how it's to be built, the 12 stones upon the breastplate, which are bearing the names of the children of Israel according to their tribes. And I want you to remember, these are precious stones, holy. So you get to verse 29 after he describes how the breastplate is supposed to be created. And he says in verse 29, so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in his breastplate of judgment. It keeps saying that, in the breastplate of judgment on his heart. And when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord and in the breastplate of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim and they shall be on Aaron's heart. And when he goes before the Lord and Aaron shall bear, listen, Aaron is gonna bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord. Now, how many of you know that Jesus Christ, the great high priest bore our judgment upon his heart, yeah. 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 upon grace, which is the closest piece of clothing to the body, the nakedness of the body. And upon his grace, he bore our judgment before the Lord. And the greatest judgment, I want you to hear this today, the greatest judgment to hit the earth at the same time was also the greatest act of love the world had ever seen. Okay, so we understand because I already know that there is these questions of, well, I don't need you between me and God. That's not at all. Again, don't put words in my mouth of what I'm not saying today. I am not saying that your leaders stand between you and God and hold your hand in the closet and you say something to them and then they say it to God. That's not, that's weird. And that is Old Testament. And Jesus has tore the veil for you to boldly alone approach the throne of grace and hear the words of your beloved father, Hephzibah. God delights in you. Okay, so, so that is absolutely true. But I want you to hear, I am not today talking about your intimacy with God. Clear? I'm not talking about you spending time with Jesus and hopefully you do. Hopefully you give him your attention. You spend time with him. You can't know someone unless you're intimate with them. All right, I, I'm, but again, that's not the message today. I want you to say the word assignment. Say assignment. When it comes to the assignment of the body of Christ, we need each other, right? We need accountability. I mean, how many things have you seen go crazy because a leader doesn't have a father? Because a leader doesn't have accountability and they wonder why everything is crashing and burning around them because they got no one in their life saying, no. I wanted to quit three times, like two years ago. I was just having the worst season of my life. And I went to my dad's office, I've shared this with you. And he's like studying. And I said, Bubba, and I was serious. I mean, I was emotional. I'm like, I thought, because you know how sometimes we think emotions is discernment, but it's just emotions. I thought the Lord is like giving me this out. And I was like, I'm gonna tell the whole family we're moving to Florida and I'm just gonna go and sit in the Jesus image room. That's where I was at. I'm just being completely honest. And I walked into the office and I said, Bob, I think I'm supposed to step down and, and just like give the church someone else. He didn't even look up from his notes. He said, that's the devil, get out of my office. I walked in and I said, and I walked out. That's called the reproof of a father 
that loves you, that has a perspective seeing this day that his wimpy little son, that he knows you've got to overcome. And if you don't, you'll never get here. So I'm not gonna coddle you and say, it's gonna be, yeah, you wanna stop? Okay, come on. This is what pastors are like. Nobody wants correction. Nobody wants to be led. I'm my own Christian. Good luck. Paul said, I have begotten you in Christ. Do you know how strong of a statement that is? He is saying, I birthed you in the Lord. What? I thought Jesus did that. Paul's got problems. That's how we act in the church. Paul said, I've begotten you in the Lord. My brother, he talked about last week, I'm cringing, I'm at home. And he's talking about, you know, don't say you're not gonna follow a man, but he's absolutely right. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I will, to his statement, my dad would always say, follow me as I follow Christ. And if I stop following Christ, run for your life. That's what he would always say growing up. But, but again, one of the biggest issues we have in the church is we have rogue leaders who are like, well, I'm a priest all alone, but you better have a priest over you. Again, not taking the high priest of Jesus Christ away from you. But when it comes to assignment, when it comes to purpose, he sets up in the body. He said it like this, first, everyone say first, not better, just first. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And I love it. Bill Johnson calls it the funnel of heaven because it says third teachers after that miracles, signs, and wonders. Like, could we not be experiencing miracle signs and wonders because we're out of order? Like, you, do you remember when Paul comes and he starts bringing correction in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 11, and he's dealing with them on how they gather together. And he says, many are sick and weak among you because you don't gather correctly. You don't wait on each other. You don't honor each other. You're just, fam everyone's familiar with everyone. You sit down at the table, you start buttering your bread. Nobody's prayed yet. The leader hasn't said it's time to eat. Everyone's just doing whatever they want and everybody's buddies and it seems nice and it seems fun. But Paul is like, people are dying among you because you're out of order, because you don't honor what I have placed and set up in the body. Okay, so again, I find it fascinating that most of the time in the congregation, everyone cheers for the leader having accountability. But when that leader is now over you, you're like, nope. I thought it was good. So anyway, I know I can count our young adults. So anyway, Urim and Thummim. Sorry, what was the Urim and the Thummim? So you have this breastplate of judgment. They had a duty. They had a responsibility, the priests, according to what we just read, that their responsibility was to judge the people. That was their responsibility. Now, it's not a judgment just because I think sometimes leaders are just frustrated and they vent and they just are mad at people. But the judgment was a righteous, everyone say a righteous. It was a righteous judgment upon a garment called grace. Here's what that looks like. I, I kept thinking about this this week when I was preparing for this. When I was little, I remember one time I had this antenna and I put it in an outlet in Orlando. My mom's standing right there and my mom smacked me. And I remember it hurting being confused, I didn't do anything wrong. But she saw the way I was going led to destruction. So she slapped me and I was like, I started crying immediately, right? I cried all the time as a kid. If Costa got in trouble, I was crying. But then she had to explain to me that the discipline is not because she's mad at me because I did something horribly wrong, but the discipline was so that I didn't die. And the scriptures say, narrow is the way that leads to life and broad is the road that leads to destruction. All right, so you, God puts leaders in your life like bumpers at a bowling alley to make sure you stay on the narrow way. Now, people aren't humble enough to go, well, what do you know that I don't? But what, is your, what did your natural dad know when you were three years old that you don't? My kids right now think that they're right about everything talking about my toddlers. William is convinced he knows the decisions he should make, especially Ellie, concerned about the, the teenage years. Pray for me because she's brilliant 
man and, and manipulative. And she convinces me that she has the best plan. And then I think to myself, hold on. Like I start going there. I'm like, no, no, you're, you're four. You don't know plans. But think about what the world teaches is kids now can go get a sex change without their parents giving, giving a, an okay for it. And we just say that that's right. But, but how hypocritical of us that we act like this in the church. But then we're mad at the Democrats. right? We just do things and we don't have leadership. We don't want fathers because we've watched too many, heard too many podcasts in YouTube about how they take advantage of people, right? But, but because someone abused prophecy, we don't stop prophesying. Because someone abused maybe healing and lied, we don't stop praying for healing, but be, we build doctrine on people's weaknesses. And the Lord goes, many are sick and weak among you because you're out of order, so attention I deal with this is I have leaders. I've got people in the church that are 30 years older than me. And I've had to learn that God called me to be a father to a 60 year old. That's hard for me to appeal to swallow. Thank you. Right? But this is my role. This is his role within the body. And I would be disobedient to God not to bring proper judgment when I see a road leading to destruction. And if we can have the humility to receive and go, okay, maybe Lord, you've set up the body at Risen Nation Church. Again, I want you to hear today. I know this is intense. I ain't talking to the world. I'm talking to you. We're having family talk today. If you're online or this is your first time. Hey, if it's, if it's your first time here, Jesus, I thank you for them that you cover them in their hearts. But welcome to Risen Nation. And, and, and I don't, I want you to know, like, if you're joining this house, you're joining a real family. And we're going to talk like family. We're going to act like family. We're not just going to say we're family and then never deal with anything, talk to anyone, and not go to a family group and just show up and get my fill when Kaylee's singing. Like, the Lord is looking for real, authentic family, okay? So the Urim and the Thummim, upon this breastplate of judgment, you had two pockets inside of it. They weren't visible and you had two smooth stones that they called the Urim and the Thummim. Part of me wishes we still had the Urim and the Thummim because it makes decisions easy. Because what would happen is people would come before the priests, okay? And they would say, I wanna do this and I wanna do this and I need insight from the Lord. Now, the scriptures are very unclear of how they would get the response. But how many remember they would cast lots in the New Testament even? right? They're picking a new apostle. They casted lots to see who it would land upon. Well, this was part of the culture of the Old Testament and New Testament in that it was kind of like, okay, whatever the Lord wants, it'll happen. And so some scholars would say one rock got hot and one didn't, or one lit up and one didn't. And it was like the priest would put his hand in the, in the breastplate of judgment and he would judge what is God saying. And he would tell the people, thumb them, it's hot. That's what God's saying. And it, and it means judgment. It's, it's Moses would sit. How many of you remember Moses is sitting among the, is, the Israelites? There's millions of them. And, and Jethro comes in and says, you're going to kill yourself. You got to raise 70 elders with your spirit. And I'm going to take some of your spirit, Moses, and I'm going to put it on them. And if we could get that as a leadership, we would begin to experience I believe anointing and not because of me, but we would begin to experience anointing because God breathes on unity, according to Psalms 133, right? Paul said, strive to be of one spirit and one heart. One of the most confusing, I mean, I've been a part of things where you've got 14 different voices throughout the week preaching to you and they're all saying something different and people are just confused out of their minds. Be of one spirit and one heart, the scriptures say. So the Lord took some of Moses' spirit and he gave it. I mean, this is what we've been learning a couple of weeks ago. You can give peace, the scriptures say. You can give reconciliation. This is unbelievable. You can give spirit. It says the imparting of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. Like we can transfer this to one another. We gotta be willing to be on the breastplate together though. So there's always two kinds of people in the house, those that actually want to be covered and those that don't want to be on the breastplate. And it's always the ones not on the breastplate that are offended because they think the judgment is condemnation. But when you start to realize you got a parent slapping you because you don't want to go the way of destruction, you'll only know that if they're bearing the name upon their heart. 
Okay, so the Urim and the Thummim, it represents, listen, discernment. Write it down. The Urim and the Thummim, it represents discernment. It's the insight God gives to make decisions. It's righteous discernment given to people that God will place over you in your life to lead those that you bear upon your heart. Now, I do want you to write this down. This is a side note, but I think it's important to note. It's very easy to confuse emotion with discernment. Very easy. One is a function of the spirit. The other is a function of your flesh, right? You might emotionally feel something for someone that you don't necessarily agree with, but it's not about you agreeing with it. It's about you discerning from the Holy Spirit. What is God saying, right? Pastor Jenny released a word about during this transition, you're gonna see God is moving chess pieces around. It's what he's doing right now. And he will tell some of you to remain faithful here. And I pray you would listen to remain faithful here. Some he will uproot and he'll hurl them across the nation like he's doing to my family, right? Or he'll, or he'll tell this one to go here. Some people he's sending to Chicago that are a part of this community, right? So the, the key is, and we talked about this with our staff, is God is dealing with everybody individually of what he's called them to. Don't look over the fence and judge what somebody else is doing right? And so we emotionally go, well, I don't think this is best for them. So I'm going to tell them about it, but it's not discernment. It's just your emotions. So you got to be careful that you don't turn discernment into emotion. Now, priesthood, that word priesthood, what does it mean to be a priest? Again, this does apply to all of us, but I was specifically talking about church government. It's to stand in between. You're an intercessor, Exodus 18, 19 says of the priesthood that their role is to be for the people Godward. What does that mean? It means those that God has called you to lead, you bear and you bear them Godward. You're gonna see it in a minute in the New Testament. And there's a reason why I'm, I'm talking about all of these things, I promise. So just to recap, Exodus 28, what is closest to the body? Grace. So every, every judgment that God entrusts a leader to give has to be on the foundation of God's grace and mercy. It is never, ever about rejection and kicking them out. That's never the goal. The goal is never just to simply mark them as being ones that cause division and just leave it like that. The goal, the ministry we've been given is reconciliation. And how many of you know righteousness and rightness are two very different things? And I think sometimes people just in self-righteousness want to prove their rightness rather than righteous judgment that actually leads people to a way of life. Okay, so again, the best understanding we have in the world is a parent with their children. How many of you have kids? Raise your hand. Okay, then you will get this in that I've learned that in the early years of my kids, I discipline a lot, a lot. And it's the discipline that shapes them and forms them. It's the discipline of Benji does something like pee on the floor. He's really into peeing on the floor right now. And we're not even potty training him yet. He just drops his diaper, right? But I'm watching him form where before he pees on the floor, and I'm like, what are you doing? And I got to look at him a little spank on his butt cheeks. And at first, he would refuse to say sorry. There was one day, Emily and I were like, we are going to do this. We are going to be good parents. I took a full hour almost trying to get this kid to say sorry. And he's just staring at me. And, he's got, and then he starts doing this smile that's cute. And you can't smile back because you're disciplining him. We put him in timeout. Nothing worked. I tried all the Danny Silk techniques. None of it worked for Benji. All right? But what works with Benji, now some of you might be offended with this, but I spank my kids. Not out of anger. You do it in a righteous way. You know what the word chastening means in scripture? It means to spank. That's what it means. The root of the Lord chastens us. He spanks us. And so Benji now, he's still doing it because this is the nature that we got to work out, the Adam out of him. And 
He still pulls his diaper down. He still is peeing on the floor, but now he immediately after the pee's on the floor, he goes, sorry, Bubba, sorry. And he thinks that that, he thinks that because he's saying sorry, that it's fine. So now we got to move into a new step of discipline. And we keep forming and we keep shaping. And, and so now he doesn't have any problems saying sorry because if we had to learn a lesson before we're like, if you just say sorry, we'll be, you'll be fine. So now he does anything else. He said, sorry. <laughs> He's brilliant. These kids are brilliant. And then you got to figure out consequences and, and you discipline them. But the goal is that when he's 18, he's not peeing on the floor still. And I don't know how to other than say this, but we got a lot of people just peeing on the floor because they were unwilling to be disciplined as children. Making a mess. Never had a father. I think the same issue in the world where everybody's a they and a her and whatever God's name they think they can be is fatherlessness. We have that same issue in church called fatherlessness. And we were like, everybody just be your own sound. That's not biblical. It's not. It's one of the things I can't wait to correct in Nashville. Just being honest, if you're watching, I'm sorry. There's this whole movement of like, everybody's got their own sound. No, no, no. The scriptures say there's only one sound. And we all have to join that sound. It doesn't belong to anybody. It's no one's sound but God. In the, in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles 5, you didn't have, you had 120 people and all they did was play a note of a trumpet. There wasn't one of them that was like, let me be spontaneous in this moment, be authentic, be myself. They would have been stoned. They had to play the same exact, Thing. And what does it say? Not till they were of one sound. Second Chronicles 5. Not till they were of one, one, everyone say one, one sound that the spirit of God came with such power, no one could even stand and minister. What does it say in Acts 2? Not till they were singing in what? One accord did the Holy Spirit come with a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It's one sound. It's not William's sound. It's not Pastor Gerardo's sound. It is God's sound that we have to tune our lives into the frequency of. So the priesthood, our job is to judge. Our job is to reprove and encourage the scriptures say. First Timothy says, rebuke with all authority and encourage. But rebuking with all authority gets you 14 people. But here's what our commitment was to the Lord, a house for him. And as long as we stick to that, the 14 are gonna be a phenomenal quality of people that will impact cities. That's just what I believe. I'm convicted by it. Okay, so the priesthood's job, stand in between. It's intercession. It's you are for the people toward God. You bear them before the Lord. You pray for them. You undergird them. It's you carry it like you're carrying their, the son's names upon your shoulders, right? I'll tell you, anybody that I would say is like a spiritual son, before they tell me what they're going through, I often feel it. You can ask them, I'll feel it. Because there's a reality, there is truth to God puts people in your life. My dad, I'll be going through something and I'll get a call from my dad of, you okay? Just like that. No, I'm horrible. And he's like, interesting. And just hearing his voice, I feel refuge. I feel protection. Go to Ezekiel 44 really quick. I'm sorry. I'm trying to be faster, but I'm doing a lot of rambling today. Ezekiel 44, let's, get, let's do it quick. Verse five. The Lord said, son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I shall tell you concerning all the statutes of the temple of the Lord and its laws. Mark well the entrance to the temple and all of the exits of the sanctuary. What's amazing is Pastor Cosby was talking about this, having no idea that this is what I was gonna be teaching on. But it goes through verses six to, to seven. It says, you did not, uh, you didn't follow the charge of keeping my holy things. You didn't protect the holy things, verse eight says, but you have set others. This is what I think a lot of leaders do. You have set others to keep my charge for you in my sanctuary. There's an authority that God is giving Pastor Costi in this season that he is not allowed to delegate to anyone else. There's an authority that God will put on a worship leader 
And that worship leader over the team is not allowed to delegate that authority to anyone else. I think a hard thing I've had to learn is I'll see something, I won't deal with it, and I'll call it love. Well, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to offend them. And you try to delegate that authority for another to take care of, but it won't carry the weight because it's your responsibility. So we're not good at confronting people because we're afraid of everybody. But if you really love them, remember, the linen, the linen garment, which represents the cover of grace, is the closest thing to the heart of the priest. It's upon that garment that you bear the names of the sons of Israel to bring proper judgment. Okay, so the Lord is saying in, in Ezekiel 44, verse 8, that you delegated your authority, priests. And because you delegated your authority, you will not be allowed to sit at my table. It goes on and it says in verse nine, thus says the Lord, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh and all the foreigners who are among my people of Israel shall enter my sanctuary because they went astray, right? It says the Levites who went far from me going astray from me after their idols when Israel went astray shall bear their punishment. What is it saying? Because you just followed what the people wanted because you were unwilling to take your authority, because you were unwilling to be who God's called you to be in false humility, you have followed the people. And in following the people, you 